Hey everybody, long time no see. Sorry uh, about the long time between my last video and this one. Um, this is my second attempt. The first one, I was trying to just do it on one topic, but since it was only gonna be one video, it ended up being way too long. So, uh, new strategy is a bunch of videos that are not very long, where I just talk about one thing, which I'm gonna try to stick to. Um, the main point of the first one is the overall uh, prediction, which is mostly going to focus on the presidential race, but there'll probably be a little bit of touching on other races as well. Um, the long and the short of it is, I think that even if Trump had somehow managed to run like a normal race that minimized the amount of time people spent talking about his negative qualities and uh, put his best foot forward as far as, you know, the potential for a second Trump term, either in regards to specific policies or his erratic behavior and the overall impact his narcissism has on not just the government and how well it functions, but the mental health of the country as a whole. Um, even if he had managed to, you know, do a, a you know, as good a job with his assignment as Kamala Harris has done with hers, it still would have been a real long shot for Trump to be able to pull this out. And that comes down to the basic numbers of the population and what those demographics are. So let's talk about this race in a hypothetical which gives Trump every uh, benefit of the doubt we're gonna, for the moment, ignore the fact that he disqualifies himself anew every single day. Um, we're gonna ignore the fact that most of what people remember as being good as far as low info or, you know, Fox News, Newsmax, brainwashed type voters, what they think of as being the good things about Trump's first term as people who actually pay attention to facts know mostly was just a knock-on effect from Obama. And then, you know, when everything fell apart during COVID, you know, his followers like to give him the benefit of the doubt on that. But, um, you know, you don't just get a mulligan because something hard happened. When you're president, you've got to deal with whatever lands on your desk. And, you know, he didn't. But let's just, let's just give him the benefit of the doubt in every single possible way. We'll say he's proven himself to be contrite about January 6th. We'll really give him, you know, a, a level of, of benefit of the doubt that would truly be impossible in regards to the actual man. You know, we'll just invent, we'll invent a positive 2024 for him that just wasn't ever p possible because of who the man is constitutionally. Um, but let's just assume he did everything right and uh, the Democrats had an average campaign. You know, maybe Biden stayed in in this hypothetical, maybe it ended up being Harris, but either way, they were able to muster average turnout and enthusiasm, or maybe slightly better than average turnout and enthusiasm. Not the way it is now, and not the way it is in like 2008, because that's the scenario that I was first envisioning. Um, and frankly, the context in which this came up the first time, it was me trying to explain to some Trump supporters how few of them there really are, which is a little bit of a pet peeve for me when people talk about the country being evenly divided and about how it's a 50-50 country. That's just nonsense. Trump supporters are nowhere near half the country. They're barely half of the Republican Party. Um, and the Republican Party is definitely not even half the country. That's something that is sort of taken for granted, especially by people who don't, you know, spend a lot of time looking at the numbers. Even people who do spend a lot of time on politics and all the other attendant things that go with it. Unless you actually look at voting patterns, you know, at a nitty gritty level, it's very likely that you've never noticed the fact that less than 30% of the electorate are registered Republicans. And I've seen a lot of conflicting numbers for Democrats, so even if you just don't pay any attention to the new voters that have registered this past year, which have been overwhelmingly 
in favor of Democrats overall, unless that's changed, or there are some jurisdictions which, in which Republicans did particularly good, which are sort of like, you know, micro results that conflict with the big picture. When I last checked, Democrats were doing much better on new voter registration, but um, the low end is, it's 31 or 32 percent Democrats, and the high numbers I've seen are like 36, 37 percent. I haven't done the work to figure out which of those numbers are more reliable. I have a feeling it's probably somewhere in between. I feel like the 31 percent number is kind of old, um, which is a big part of uh, what's wrong with so many of the metrics that we rely on, as you'll, as you'll hear me discuss at some point in this video. Um, the point is, uh, we're not a 50-50 country. The closest we ever come to being a 50-50 country is really being a 30-30-30 country, which is 30% conservative, 30% progressive or liberal, and 30%, you know, could go either way depending on the context of the issue or the personalities of the people involved or, you know, their own experiences and or they just aren't interested and, and just want to get on with their lives and don't really have an opinion, you know. Um, but this is the other thing, you know, for a long time, for most of my life, only about half the population voted. It's been a little bit better lately, and I think, honestly, between um, the tumult of the Trump years and the pandemic and everything else, um, it's not surprising people have been engaging a little bit more, but interestingly enough, um, there do appear to be some shifting trends as far as the way generational um, cohorts are acting, which I'll get to as well. Um, the long and the short of it is, MAGA is not that many people. You know, during the primary, consistently, pollsters were reporting that Republican likely voters we're saying between 50% of them and at the high end, like 60, 65% of them wanted Trump to be the nominee. Um, and as I'm sure most people who will end up watching a video like this will recall, um, even after everybody else had dropped out of the race and Nikki Haley had dropped out of the race, between 10 and 20% of Republican primary voters were still going out, even in bad weather, to cast votes for Nikki Haley, knowing that, you know, she had dropped out. Um, and imagine the scenario, right? I mean, the Trump people are trying to claim that all those votes are supposedly on the table for them. But imagine the scenario in which a person is gonna go out to cast a vote for Nikki Haley on a night that's cold and nasty, which would be much better to stay in their, their nice warm house, maybe by their fire, or at least under a, a comforter on their couch watching whatever their favorite TV show is, but instead of doing that, they're going out in, in, a, in a snowstorm to cast a vote for a candidate who's dropped out of the race. That person is very unlikely to now turn around in November and vote for Donald Trump. So for the most part, that person should just be written off. So, <coughs> excuse me. Um, in the hypothetical we're painting where Trump has done everything right and, you know, Otherwise, hypothetically, 100% of previous Trump voters are available to him. That alone could be enough to cost him the election. And then there's some other really big trouble spots for Trump as far as, you know, trying to come up with an accurate model of what this electorate is going to look like versus previous electorates. Um, there was a study that came out in 2022 or tw maybe early 2023. It got a lot of press, though. It looked at uh, excess mortality rates in uh, Ohio and Florida because it wanted to see what impact the pandemic would have on the election in 2022, I think, is when they were doing the work for. I, but like I said, I don't know if the, if the work was published before or after the election. Um, they wanted to see if more Democrats or Republicans basically had died during the pandemic. And what they found in Ohio and Florida, and which can, you know, reasonably be extrapolated to the other states, is that there was overall far more excess mortality among registered Republicans than Democrats, which is actually pretty predictable when you think about the level of uh, mask usage and vaccine uptake in 
you know, predominantly Democrat voting areas versus predominantly Republican voting areas. So it's pretty predictable, especially if you look at early on the rates of who was dying um, and, you know, who was ending up hospitalized and which, how many of those people were dying. The demographics were horrible for Republicans, and I'm sure people like Mitch McConnell and Lindsey Graham were very well aware of that. Um, but, you know, that only actually held true until Biden came in and implemented Vax and Relax. Um, once Vax and Relax came into effect and all the people who had otherwise dutifully been wearing masks in indoor public spaces that had been protecting them even when the vaccines had been getting further and further away from the current variants genetically and therefore less effective, um, everybody dropped the masks and the difference in excess mortality between red states and blue states disappeared. So let that be a lesson to you. Um, you should be wearing a mask in shared air situations. We could be cleaning the air, but we're not, which is one of the things that the Biden administration has definitely uh, gotten horribly, horribly wrong. But since we're not going to do a second Biden administration, I'm not going to worry too much about beating them up since we do have the opportunity to pivot now that it's going to be a Kamala Harris administration. But anyway, going back to the numbers, the raw numbers, um, even though it was only for the first year and a half, and after that there was a relatively equal amount of excess mortality from COVID from the point the study ended until now, or and from the point when Vax and Relax came in until now, um, just that first year and a half was enough to, to remove millions more Republicans from the electorate than Democrats. So even if Trump didn't have the problem within the Republican Party that he has, even if that problem could be disappeared with a magic wand, he would still have the issue of the excess mortality for a year and a half from COVID because of the way he messaged and because of the fact that his followers, you know, more or less followed what he did, although of course he didn't make much progress on getting them to take the vaccine, which I think even he was surprised by, but um, that's another factor. Anyway, there's another major demographic issue that um, just by itself could have completely put this thing out of Trump's reach, which is that um, since 2020, apparently over 20 million baby boomers have died. I first heard that from Anthony Scaramucci and I tried to find it and I found people talking about it and trying to find out where he got it from. There were a couple of articles that could have been the source based on the, the title and the first paragraph, but they were behind paywalls, so um, I didn't really feel like chasing it down. From the best I can tell based on what, you know, is the predicted number of baby boomers that should have died each year in the absence of the pandemic, plus the mortality as the result of the pandemic, um, 20 million plus makes sense as far as the number of baby boomers that have been uh, removed from the electorate. And then the flip side of Scaramucci's stat is that on top of that, over 40 million Gen Z voters have been added to the electorate, and that I did find verification for. Um, the, that stat is like 60 million Gen Z voters have turned 18 since the last election and more than 40 million of them have registered to vote. And I think this is probably mostly based on new voter registration and the 2022 election and the primaries, but um, according to the people who do analysis of these things, uh, Gen Z uh, defies some of the old outdated conventional wisdom which said that young people don't vote as much as old people so even if that conventional wisdom was not out of date just the fact that so many people that otherwise would have leaned heavily toward trump in previous elections are now not living and therefore no longer going to be able to participate in the election there's also the issue of the gen z voters which you know vastly outnumber the people who died anyway there is a quirk which is, I think, confounding some of the polls and making them, you know, be off by even more. I mean, in addition to the fact that their models overall are off, which is that, you know, in previous 
elections, the older generations were more heavily dominated by the silence and what remained of the so-called greatest generation. Um, whereas now there's a lot of baby boomers who are over 65 and baby boomers as a whole are much more progressive than the silence and their parents. Um, so even if hypothetically the over 65 cohort leaned the same way it did in previous elections, Trump probably wouldn't have enough of them left to, to have a result like he's had previously. On top of which, this 65 plus cohort is going to favor him much less than previous 65 and older cohorts did just by nature of the fact that it's more heavily baby boomer than it is silent generation, etc. Um, so, you know, just, just those demographic changes alone, even if Trump had run a flawless campaign and had picked a perfect VP and everybody had amnesia and, you know, he somehow convinced us that he had good ideas for the economy and he didn't have Project 2025, et cetera, et cetera. Um, any one of those things could have made it mathematically impossible for him to win. Um, but he has all three of those things. Um, depending on how you count, I guess it could be more than three. On top of which, there's the Dobbs effect, which is that, you know, everything I said before assumes that uh, in terms of turnout, it will be a close to 50-50 split, but turnout will not actually reflect the actual population, because that's the other factor, which is confounding the poll results. Old conventional wisdom says that the older generations are much more Republican than younger generations, but they, re they vote much more reliably, and they were a shrinking demographic, and they've been a shrimp shrinking dem demographic for a very long time. And the fact is, you know, the, 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 the big conclusion of this video is that not only is it likely to be a historic landslide, but we're going to see the results of what has been a brewing generational electoral shift um, for multiple election cycles, but which has been uh, confounded and uh, prevented and pushed off by both Trump, you know, kind of re reshaping the electorate just a little bit and the Democrats basically employing the worst possible strategy in order to deal with him. And um, I will make a different video where I talk more about that. Um, that was part of what made the first video way too long, which is that I tried to talk about all of this stuff in one video. But um, I've already gone long enough on this one that I don't want to get bogged down on the topic of what the Democrats did wrong to land us with Trump. But I will say this, um, you know, the Dobbs effect by itself, again, could be a 5 to 15 point uh, bite into what otherwise could have been, you know, 47 to 48 percent of uh, the electorate for Trump, um, just based on Dobbs alone. We know, of course, from Ohio and from Kansas and from, you know, various other referendums that have happened since uh, the Dobbs case that at least some conservative women and probably some conservative men are willing to cross party lines on that issue. And it's not surprising because, as I've said multiple times to multiple people since it happened, I'm sure there are lots of conservative men and women who know that pregnancies can frequently go wrong in unpredictable and tragic ways and that sometimes you know, the clinically appropriate response to a wanted pregnancy going wrong is an abortion so as to preserve the life and fertility and health of the mother so that they can try again, you know? If a family wants to have um, a quiverful, um, which is definitely a, a, a dog whistle or a, or a, I don't know, an auditory Easter egg, whatever you want to uh, characterize it as, if a family just wants to have a bunch of kids for whatever reason, ideologically, um, you know, they're more statistically likely to have run into some kind of a pregnancy problem at some point in their journey of building the family they want to have. And I have to guess as a result of being aware of that, that there are at least some people who consider themselves pro-life who would never have an abortion that wasn't 
you know, medically necessary, uh, who have seen the result of this race to the bottom with red states trying to outdo each other on their anti-reproductive freedom agenda and the fact that it's it's lethal for women and girls. And frankly, it's not surprising that people who have made it obvious in legislative sessions in state houses all over the country and t time and time again that they don't understand the actual, you know, physiological mechanism of reproduction or where women carry fetuses in their bodies or you know what the likelihood is that a body will spontaneously abort a fetus that's not healthy enough to to make it to term um, and all the other ways that things can go wrong even when you are privileged enough to have you know a, a stable home and a a supportive partner and lots of financial resources and every other thing you could possibly check off things still sometimes go wrong and we've seen the results of that in Texas when women can't get what all of the doctors know is the obvious uh, right choice clinically um, so that even though they are losing the baby they wanted they might have the option to try again and you know Bravely, we've seen many women step up and bring lawsuits and advocate so that people who didn't necessarily experience these things firsthand will still understand the impacts um, and be able to take their stories into the voting booth with them. And of course, as of late, we've also had additional reminders with these tragic cases out of Georgia and Texas. and. This is the tip of the iceberg. We're, I mean, there's probably already been thousands of these deaths and situations where people lost their fertility um, or had other horrific medical nightmares. Um, because again, another topic for a different kind of a video at another point, but you know, this is a country where you never want to have to tangle with the medical system and anything that's as um, invasive as giving birth even without having some kind of a complication or a medical emergency or needing to have a surgery or you know having you know a fertility disaster or any combination of the above um you know the last thing you need is to have uh your doctors worried about being sued or charged criminally or having their licenses yanked away and the fact is, even if you can find doctors in a scenario like that who are willing to treat you, there's going to be a hell of a lot less doctors willing to practice in those states. So the fact is, the so-called pro-life movement has made it clear that beyond just not understanding the reality of the situation or maybe not caring about it, um, when you allow people who belong to a minority religious sect of Christianity, because this is not even all Christians, this is just certain types of Christians, when you allow them to dominate not only an entire political party, but, you know, absolutely set the agenda and the conversation, frame the conversation on an issue like abortion for decades, um, and then some zealots on the Supreme Court, you know, rip off anything that was holding them back, which in this case was Roe, and let them just go willy-nilly, free will, you know, free, free, I guess I'm about to say free willy, um, which is, which is a really, which is a really weird, uh, which is a really weird little brain fart to have in the middle of what I was trying to say. The point is, they go hog wild, they go, they go crazy on these issues, trying to prove that they're the most committed to life quote unquote, but in reality, it's all uh, on this foundation of, you know, very ardent uh, biblical literalism. And it seems to engender this fatalism, both in men and women. So obviously some of these people understand the physical mechanism, or at least even if they don't get sex ed or don't have parents who teach them how their bodies work, by the time they're having babies, they have to be figuring it out just at least a little bit, right? So even if the women understand this, if 
they've been raised in a fundamentalist Christian environment where they've been told over and over and over again um, all the reasons for the uh, anti-reproductive freedom point of view and none of the reasons for the <laughs> reproductive freedom point of view. Um, you know, it's going to be much easier for them to give into the whole fatalistic, it's God's will aspect of this. But the fact is, even for those women that are in a situation like that, they're the ones that are going to die. They're the ones that are going to have to go through the medical trauma. They're the ones that are going to maybe lose their fertility and, you know, everything else that goes with that. So I would, I would not be surprised if, you know, the difference that we're seeing in the number of men and the number of women who have voted early um, is, is not indicative of the fact that even if some conservative men are willing to vote on the issue of choice, I think overwhelmingly the people who cross over on that issue are going to be women. And it's going to be because of this factor, you know, it, if people want to be pro-choice, that's fine. But when politicians start uh, being a part of the conversation, you know, famously from the previous election, it should be between a woman, her doctor, and her local politician. When that's the world we're living in, um, it just so easily leads to catastrophe and the zealotry and the race to the bottom, you know, the lowest common denominator aspect of the way this has played out has just been horrific. But you know, it's par for the course. I try to be optimistic, um, but there's a lot of reasons not to be, even even though I would love to buy into uh, the idea that we're going to turn the corner tomorrow. Um, anyway, the point is, you know, all of these hypotheticals that I've been spinning here, you know, if, if if Trump had done everything right and 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 he was a different kind of a person and he had chosen a different VP and he wasn't openly working with Russia and he there weren't Epstein tapes and there weren't, you know, people from his administration talking about how he's a fascist and he wasn't acting out the dictionary definition of fascism every single day and as I said, disqualifying himself anew. Any one of these things would be enough to make it mathematically not possible for him to, to do what he did in 2016. And since all of them are in play, I think it's safe to say that it's just not happening for him. And I think he knows it's not happening for him and that's why he's run the race the way he has. Um, it was, I think, a strategic blunder to pick J.D. Vance. Everybody says it's because he was thinking he was going to run up the numbers with his base, but I don't think there's that many numbers there to run up. And I think part of that is probably a little bit of him buying his own lies, and part of it is just a, a byproduct of the psychology. You know, it's, it's a very common fallacy where people... People assume that their position is the majority position, and that might be part of what allows democracy to work because everybody kind of feels like they're the majority position. Um, and I'm sure that some people are going to hear me say that and say, well, you know, you're a progressive and you're saying there are more progressives than, than centrists in the Democratic Party and more leftists overall versus you know, conservatives, but the fact is that's not just my opinion, that's not just my sense of things, that's borne out by decades of opinion polls. Um, the, it's, the reason it doesn't look like that is a combination of the Electoral College, the stranglehold that the two parties have, both on debates, on keeping third parties out of races altogether, keeping candidates that don't toe the party line out of uh, races that are just between, you know, primaries that are just between one party. It goes on and on and on and on. So many of the things that Democrats criticize Republicans for, they've done in the past. Democrats tend, in my experience, not to cheat against Republicans, at least not since, you know, elections that are long enough ago that none of those people are alive anymore. The people Democrats do cheat against are other Democrats, and it's insidious, and that's the overall thesis that you'd hear if you listen to a video that I'll be making after this about, you know, the autopsy of how we got here and how the Democrats can avoid leaving themselves open to, a, you know, negative populist like Trump in the future. Because um, frankly, we've all been saved by his incompetence and the next one might not be, so we all need to shape up. And, and the 
easiest way to avoid a future Trump is for the Democrats to stop futzing around and actually start serving their own base as opposed to trying to appeal to Republicans and preemptively capitulating to the demands of the corporations before you even start negotiating. So anyway, this is of course twice as long as I expected it to be, but it's a third the length of the video that I tried the first time and deleted, so that's an improvement. Um, I'm gonna wrap this up, rewatch it, and get on to whatever the next topic is gonna be. The long and the short of it is Trump was probably always gonna lose, um, but don't take it from me. Don't take this as a reason not to vote because even if your vote doesn't matter in the presidential race, either because of the electoral college, because you live in one of the 40 or so states that uh, get no attention whatsoever, although I think more of them could be in play given what I've laid out here this year than people have talked about, and that that poll everybody was buzzing about from Iowa is probably an early indication. Although, interestingly, even the Harris campaign is not saying that they think they're actually going to win Iowa, whereas I think they might win Iowa by more than that poll indicated, basically. That's how far off I think the polls are. Even the best, most uh, accurate gold standard pollsters who are likely to get the closest, like the pollster who did this poll out of Iowa, which of course Trump is saying is an example of people doing junk polls, which is the opposite of the truth. Um, I think even she's off because she's allowing her model to be infected by too much outdated conventional wisdom, which is the problem that most of the pollsters have, it's the problem most of the pundits have, it's, it's the problem most of the strategists have. Um, it's difficult for them to, on the fly, intuitively sense what the 2024 electorate is going to be. And I think that I, for whatever reason, have a better sense of that. Maybe it's because I'm an outsider, maybe it's because of the kind of neurodivergent I am, you know, a little bit of ADD, a little bit of autism, a little bit of, you know, hyper-focus on politics for a few decades, and this is what you get. So, um... Anyway, if you liked what you heard, throw a like on it. Thanks for sticking around to the end. Um, if you're interested in uh, my thoughts on um, how things were earlier in the year, I've got a video from the summer from before Biden dropped out where I was advocating that Biden drop out <laughs> and that Kamala Harris take the spot, um, which is feels good to be right about it in retrospect. And I think I'm going to be right about this and I'm you know, sticking my neck out a little bit more than other people are. I've said all of these things in type for uh, for months, but putting it all in one video uh, feels good and 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 less uh, truncated than any of the conversations in which I've tried to communicate these things to anybody else. So um, thanks for hanging out through the whole video. Uh, throw me a like, subscribe if you want to hear more, um, and uh, some of the other videos I'm going to cover hopefully today. Um, and, and, and get done and processed in time to post um, before we get too late into the evening um, are the, the post-mortem. I'm going to do an autopsy about how we got here, mostly from the perspective of the Democratic Party. Um, I'm going to hopefully do one that's the case against Trump. I'm going to do one that's the case for Harris, and I'm going to do one that's more focused on reforms and what's going to come next, both for, um, you know, how the system needs to change and also what needs to happen to the people who have uh, been co-conspirators and um, otherwise, you know, um, made excuses for, been apologists for, been um, participants in the project of Trumpism, which is the project of fascism. And what it comes down to is, you know, for all the problems I have with Kamala Harris, and as I said many times, my vote doesn't actually matter, I'm gonna, at some point today, go and cast my ballot, and I'm gonna cast my vote for Kamala Harris. Not because I'm a loyal Democrat, or because I think she's gonna be, um, perfect or embody all my wishes and dreams, but because she's the anti-fascist choice. And, um, you know, if there's, if there's anything that, uh, if there's any political word that could be used to describe me, it would have to be anti-fascist. So, you know, and I don't mean that in the 
Antifa tossing soup cans kind of way, even though I am a radical leftist. Um, I mean it in the same way that my grandfather was Antifa, you know, when he was trying to take the beaches at Iwo Jima as a member of the 25th Regiment of the 4th Marine Division. Um, and he was an elected Republican for over 20 years. And I have no doubt in my mind, none whatsoever, <laughs> that if he was here today, he would happily support Kamala Harris over Donald Trump. He would be nauseous at what has happened to his political party. And I think in honor of him and all the other old school conservative, small r Republican principled um, Antifa folks who, you know, carried the flag in previous generations. Once this election's over, it's all good for Kamala Harris to have some conservatives come to the table with her, but it needs to be the ones that spoke out clearly and that did not mince words when it came to Trump. Frankly, uh, Cheney didn't say enough, in my opinion. I know a lot of Democrats dig her a lot, but um, I guess I'll, I'll go into the details of what I, I'm okay with about Cheney, maybe potentially being in the, in the, in the cabinet and, and the things that bother me about Cheney. That's for another video. This one's already gone too long, but Trump was never gonna win. Don't throw your life away if you're a Trump voter. Go ahead and vote for him. Support him all you want, but don't commit crimes for him because it was, you know, everything that looked like he might win was mostly BS. And there are a lot of junk polls and even the honest pollsters aren't that close. Um, so, um, and the betting markets are completely useless because even though the, even if they couldn't be easily manipulated, which they obviously can be, there's absolutely no argument to suggest that the people who participate in them are representative of either Trump voters or Harris voters. So um, don't pay any attention to the betting markets and um, probably shouldn't pay any attention to the polls either. Just go vote, go vote, enjoy the day. Um, it's a civic holiday, it's a sacred privilege. And you know, the fact is people all over the world, their lives are gonna be impacted by the choices that we make in this election, not only at the top of the ticket, but all throughout because it's going to impact the way the House and the Senate are going to function. By the way, I think there's a very good chance that um, that the Democrats will take both houses of Congress because I think even though there will be some Republicans who will only vote for Harris and otherwise will vote for all Republicans, I have to think there's going to be at least a portion of Republican or otherwise conservative voters who are not going to vote for Republicans who were, you know, active uh, in the project of Trumpism. And, you know, maybe if I were a Republican, I would have a very hard time supporting anybody who had said, count me out on January 6th or 7th or 8th, and then gone down to Mar-a-Lago or, you know, told reporters that it was like, it was like being in Pyongyang and, and dealing with Deer Leader or that he's a despicable person or that he's demonic and everything he touches turns to garbage. I mean, these people have no integrity whatsoever, but I guess the point is something needs to happen. I'm not saying people need to be put in jail unless they actually committed crimes, but Trump voters are a different thing from Republican officials and, you know, Republican campaign operatives and the Elon Musk contingent, and the Peter Thiel contingent, and the Kurt Yarvin New Right contingent, but again, that's for another day. So um, I guess those are enough teases. Subscribe, give me a like, drop a comment. I'm interested to hear what you have to say, and uh, you know, go vote. Doesn't matter what I have to say as far as that goes. Go vote. Down ballot races are important.